Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, we're talking to uh, Rich today, who is one Hello. of our, um, our course advisors and also one of our tutors. Uh, double whammy there for you. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a TEFL advisor as well. And we'll just be running through some questions of Rich, seeing, um, talking about his experiences teaching abroad, um, as well as kind of tutoring as part of TEFL org as well. Um, if you do have any questions for him, please, please, please do pop them in the comments. We'll get to them after we've uh, run through a, a few that we've prepared ourselves. Um, and yeah, if you can just be like super specific about your questions, um, just so that we can kind of answer in, in the best way possible and get the most detail out of it. Um, okay, so uh, please also tell, uh, tell us where you're from and where your view from as well, because that's always fun. Um, so to get to it now, um, we'll just start off uh, with introducing Rich. Rich, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your experience? Yeah, hi, thanks, Rachel. Uh, and thank you, everybody who's logged in at the moment. Forgive me, I can't see who's who's in here and who's not, but hello to all of you. Um, yeah, my, my name is Richard. Uh, Rich, I've been with the TEFL org for, for a couple of years now. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, I work here as one of the course advisors. So my job on a day-to-day -day basis will be um, dealing with any of the, the inquiries that you guys may have, new teachers, existing teachers, um, those wanting to take the course, uh, maybe switch careers and get into TEFL. Um, we also get a lot of inquiries from experienced TEFL teachers who are looking to do new things or maybe upskill and you know see, see where they can go next so yeah a, a wide range of, of inquiries that we get on a daily basis um i also work as again rachel mentioned as one of the course tutors here so uh if you take one of our combined courses that would include either the 20 or the 30 hours of uh, of teaching practice uh you can take them standalone courses as well but typically we offer them uh, as a combined course um, yeah, I will be one of the, the weekend tutors for those Zoom sessions and someone from a, a very much a classroom. I mean, it was chalk, chalk and blackboards when I first started teaching uh, my first classroom uh, to now doing it online. Um, I'm a bit of a, a Luddite with technology, to be honest. I've been quite uh, unwilling to move into the into the new world of teaching online. But I think as um, we one of the, the topics we may cover today is actually talking about how the classes run on Zoom, um, my experience of it and how I actually have learned to love and prefer it nowadays. A um, bit of background about me. I've been a TEFL teacher, trainer, director of studies. I've worked in a few different capacities within, within ESL, um, but for the best part of, I think, 20 years now, um, I got into TEFL fairly soon after I'd completed my studies. I was in a sales job in London and kind of got bored of the the grey the grey ground, the grey walls and the grey sky. Um, and yeah, TEFL seemed like a good idea. So I went over to Costa Rica. Um, I spent a good bit of time in Costa Rica, uh, a little bit of time in Panama and Nicaragua, but that was more kind of ad hoc volunteer teaching rather than anything uh, substantial, which I was doing uh, in Costa Rica. Um, from there, I was over to China, where I worked for uh, EF, English First, um, a company I'm sure you've probably heard of or will hear of at some point is if you get into TEFL. Um, really good company to work for, but I worked for them in a, a small, a relatively small city of 5 million people uh, in China, but right down in the, in the Guangxi province. So kind of a, a part of China that not a lot of people, certainly myself, had not had heard of before, uh, um, which was, you know, Five million people with a hundred registered foreigners was an interesting ratio, and you know, a, an introduction to China. Um, but China was great. I stayed there for on and off the best part of ten years. Um, I also worked setting up a school in Seville, or just outside of Seville, in Andalusia, in Spain. Um, a small school in the south of Italy, as well as um, setting up the English department for the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, which was kind of more EAP, English for academic purposes, but it had still come through the, the TEFL, the TEFL journey. So, yeah, kind of pretty much, pretty much all over the globe, um, as I said, most of the time as, as a teacher. Um, but then uh, probably the, the, the second half of my experience would have been in academic management. So hiring, uh, training, new teachers, um, developing curriculum uh, and 
that's kind of what's led me on to my position here with the TEFL Org, um, a job I absolutely adore and uh, an interesting sort of completion of the journey. When I when I first started um, TEFLing, my course trainers over in Costa Rica where I took my course, I just thought they had the, the dream job. They were there training English speakers. You know, we're all so nervous about how to teach somebody who doesn't speak English English. Well, they had the joy of teaching English to English speakers already. So I thought that's, you know, half the battle is won. Um, and they got to, you know, live the life out in Costa Rica, um, doing what they, you know, just, uh, as I said, do, doing what they what they love, but um, without having to kind of go through the motions of actually being a teacher. They're just having all the fun parts with the new guys. And unfortunately, my company haven't allowed me to go and set up a school in Costa Rica just yet, if anyone's listening at the yeah. TEFL Walk. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, but yeah, that's it. obviously doing that job in any in any capacity now was kind of my, my dream when I got into it to become a teacher trainer. Um, and yeah, so here here I am now, sort of the best part of uh, twenty years later. Wow, yeah, I mean you've got so much experience there, Rich. So I'm sure we'll uh, have plenty of interested um, people asking you questions about all of that. That's a really broad range. Um, Brilliant. All right. So we've started to get some comments through already. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, I'll uh, get straight to our questions first, and then we can move on to some of the questions that you've come up with already. But please do keep putting them um, in the comment section there um, as uh, whenever you think of them. Um, OK, so Rich, first question. Um, you've Well, you've kind of already told us a bit about your experience, so I'll, I'll skip that part. But um, what were you doing before you started teaching English and how did you get into it? Um, yeah, well, I mean, as I sort of touched on before, I just finished my studies, I finished uni and like many people, I'd taken a degree which didn't have any necessary or legitimate purpose moving out of university. <laughs> um, so I was at a bit of a loss at what to do. It was uh, an international relations degree, so not useless by any means, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. Um, and as I said, I was sick of the weather and um, lucky enough to have a British passport, which kind of allowed me, certainly at the time before COVID, it was a, a ticket to pretty much anywhere. Uh, and a few people have mentioned that TEFL was um, was a good way to, I didn't want to backpack, but nothing against backpacking or whistle stopping through places. That's, that's you know, the, the way that some people love to see the world and you do get to see a lot of the world doing it that way. But uh, for me, I wanted to study Spanish. Um, I really enjoyed it at school. So I wanted to go to a Spanish speaking com uh, country. I specifically lived with a homestay family as well, which I would recommend to anybody getting into TEFL. It's hilarious. It's such good fun, particularly if you don't speak a word and they don't speak a word. You get very, very good at the kind of skills that you'll actually have to take into the classroom as an ESL teacher, just to make sure that you're getting the right, the right, you're still getting your three meals a day, essentially, in your homestay. So um, yeah, that was a real kind of, uh, it, yeah, my, my motivation was to go and be in a, in a hot, beautiful place, um, learn another language and actually embed myself in another, uh, in, into another culture, which, you know, I've, I've met, uh, TEFL teachers that just like to do the gap year here and there. And again, that's fine. Um, a lot of schools are more than happy to offer a six month or a one year contract for that purpose. But, uh, yeah, my motivation was to, um, no offense to the UK, but get away from the UK for as long as I could, uh, and go and go and go and live somewhere. As I said, where I could where I could learn another language and, and experience another culture. So that's kind of really how and why I got into it. Fairly young, I'd only just finished uni by a few months. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's one of the most popular um, kind of times to to jump into TEFL once you're kind of not sure what to do with your life yet and you just want to know experience and it's also like you say yours experience was a really immersive um way to embed yourself in the culture and um kind of develop a community while you're out there which is really important um if you know you don't know anyone and it's a whole new experience so um so yeah thank you uh for that um Okay, next question. Um, what has been your favorite teaching position so far? Got a lot to choose from. I, I got over these questions. I overlooked that one. That's a good question. My favorite <laughs> position. Uh, favorite country and favorite teaching position, definitely two different questions. So yeah, my favorite teaching position. If I'm absolutely honest, I think it, it would have been with EF. Now, with a really, really big company like English First and a company which does offer operate a, a franchise system, you're going to get 
good stories and bad stories, uh, you know, a company of that size. And luckily for me, I was in definitely the, the, the good stories. It was fantastic. They were so helpful when you first came to the city. You know, they, they assigned you with kind of a buddy. So it would be one of the local teachers who would be your, your chaperone. They would help you with finding out the things that the the foreigners would need, you know, where you can get your bits of home, you know, which in China is very, very few and far between um, to even find things like basic foods that we would that we would um, miss from home. I mean, when you when you Tefl, the idea is that you're not trying to take home with you. You know, you're trying to go to another culture and experience different things. But um, for, for a young guy in China for the first time, it was quite a, a it was quite an experience. And to have the amount of support that EF gave you in terms of the orientation the induction welcome hampers when you arrive then they assigned you with a, a local member of staff who was bilingual who could help set you up with your banking uh the gym if you needed these kind of things make sure that everything set up with your apartment which was included um then they are really really keen on developing their teachers and again i've, I've worked for some small schools that take a, a big uh that, that take a huge role in, in teacher development less so than with the bigger companies that I've worked for. Um, and so a company like EF, they took me from teacher to senior teacher to director of studies, uh, and then moved me on to different schools throughout China as well. So in terms of the kind of the professional development afforded, uh, the time off as well, they give you super, super holidays. So, so many holidays um, with, with, with EF as well. Um, yeah, I think that that job in China was probably my, my best in terms of all boxes ticked. Um, working in the Chinese University of Hong Kong was an, um, an unbelievable experience. But again, you know, the, the students there were, they were economics majors who were fluent in English already. So we were doing something slightly different, but that was really, really good fun uh, to teach that cohort. But yeah, so I'd probably say EF uh, was the best company I've worked for. Um, best country I've lived in, although you haven't asked me, um, but Costa Rica. I mean, I think few people would go to Costa Rica and argue that there's a better place in this world that you can step for. <laughs> um, but yeah, then you have to kind of look at the job life balance, cost of living, uh, wages, um, amount of hours that you have, type of students. And yeah, I think all things considered, uh, EF in China was was the one for me, really. But as I said, you know, people will have different experiences of a company of that size. Um, but a bit of advice if you are going to uh, join a new company um when i was the director there i would always offer any uh, potential new uh, recruits or candidates i would offer them the opportunity to get in touch with any of my existing teaching team have a chat with them ask them what their days are like you know and if, if you ask that question and the school are reluctant to do that i mean i don't know if it's necessarily a red flag but it would potentially be an alarm bell for me why do they not want to, me to speak to their current teaching team um, so, you know, I often get asked, you know, any advice moving in, trying to find a new job, see if you can um, sound out any of their current staff and ask them about how they get on with their day to day life, what the kind of, um, you know, what the culture shock was like for them and, and, and kind of get their experiences. And again, going back to Rachel, your initial point, EF were really, really good at kind of promoting that kind of a setup around everything as well. So just to be clear, I have no allegiance to EF anymore at all. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing at the moment. But yeah, certainly in my experience, they were the company that really pulled me through the ranks. And I've got a lot of love um, for what they did. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's all great advice. Yeah. Um, thanks, Rich. That's a very uh, good answer. Um, <laughs> um, uh, there's lots of questions coming through at the minute now. Um, so yeah, just keep them coming. We'll get to them in a bit. Um, okay, Rich, one more. What uh, was the application process like? Maybe let's go for, if we talk about um, EF, uh, because like you say, that's kind of one of the biggest, most popular uh, okay. you know, providers. Um, and from applying to starting at school, how long would you say it took? Um, yeah, I mean, with, with again, this is going to depend where you're coming from, because a lot of the time uh, associated with it, for obvious reasons, is going to be if there is or isn't a working visa requirement. Um, this mm. takes a lot of time and a lot of investment from the school as well, even ahead of the teacher arriving. So um, if you're moving, I mean, I'm, I'm from the UK, so I will usually default to UK as my, my position. Um, but coming from the UK to somewhere like um, China, uh, most of the countries in the Far East, you are going to require your entry visa initially, and then the school will be in the process of uh, converting that over to a working visa once you turn up with the other documents. But that process typically takes a couple of months minimum. 
about two months or so, um, give or take. It's about an eight week period. Um, you can do the legwork yourself with regards to running around and getting your entry visa, going to the embassy consulate, whatever else you need to do, which is possible and saves you a lot of money. But it is laborious and it's quite difficult. Some people prefer just to give their money to an agency who can deal with those things. I mean, again, we don't work with any of those agencies here, but there are a lot of agencies there to help you do that, which can probably speed up the process. But I think if, if a working visa is required, you're typically talking a couple of months at least, um, but not usually much more than that. It's not like a six month period unless there's any issues that you need to uh, negate with your application, which hopefully there wouldn't be. Spain, I saw the job or I was approached for the job. One week was working the next week. It was, you know, flight from the UK, two hours. Here you go. Um, do you need a place to live? Yes. At the time, I spoke a bit of Spanish anyway, so I was able to go and find a casera or find the landlord and kind of sort that out myself. But the owner of the school collected me from the airport, asked me if I needed any of that um sorting out um and then basically gave me my timetable starting on monday and it was straight in um but again that was you know i was i was there as a slightly more experienced teacher um but there you know that was it was a it was under two weeks you know from from sort of picking up the phone first first contact to actually starting a class so again depending on you know it usually depends on the working visa that's what's going to take the time and if that's the case usually kind of keep a so I don't know, maybe eight, eight, eight to ten week time frame in mind. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And also uh, point out to uh, because of Brexit, obviously now British people do require working visas to go out to Spain as well. So please yeah. don't anybody ask us about that right more. now. <laughs> Which is, yeah, no, it's yeah. it's a very difficult one at the moment. Um, as as mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, um, we, we, we can try and keep abreast of information at the moment, but with Brexit and COVID as a double bubble um, in that respect, it's been very, very difficult to find any kind of long term roadmaps around what's happening um, for British citizens. One thing that is um, unfortunate for those of us who are maybe looking to go and work in Spain is that there are actually quite a good number of uh, repatriated English native speakers who do have the right to work in Spain at the moment. Um, but Spain particularly, I'm, I'm going to speak about it a bit more because we do get a lot of inquiries about Spain. Second, you know, other than China, it was arguably the second biggest DSL market in the world. Um, so they do have a lot of requirements. Um, however, if you do have a British passport and you don't have the EU right to work at the moment, there's, there's not a way of negating that. As things stand long term, we hope that there may be some avenues, um, uh, you know, through that. At the moment, though, if you are tuning in from Ireland, for example, um, so, you know, and they do class, of course, Irish as, as as native English speakers, and you do have, therefore, the passport to work there as well. So very, very good time if you're coming from that part of the world, trying to work within Europe. Um, without getting too far off the point, um, R Rachel has, I don't know if you've mentioned, or there were a couple of um, good blogs that we've put up about being uh, working as a digital nomad in certain countries in Europe, which you still can consider, I think Czech Republic, Portugal to maybe a couple, but yeah, Spain, unfortunately, just to sort of finish this point um, is, uh, yeah, it's it's just a no-go if you don't have the EU right to work at the moment, but we'll see how things uh, develop. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Rich. Yes, it's, uh, it's a bit um, all over the place at the moment, but we're hoping to get more information at some point. <laughs> um, Okay, so next question, moving on from Brexit swiftly. Um, <laughs> Please do, yeah. <laughs> um, what kind of um, age groups and levels were you teaching um, throughout your teaching career? Uh, all, all of them, all of yeah. them. And pretty much every TEFL teacher, you're going to at some point teach all of them. Uh, strange, well, so some people come in and they say, oh, I don't want to teach kids or I don't want to teach adults. We don't usually have people say they don't want to teach adults, to be honest. Sometimes people have uh, an apprehension of teaching kids, uh, multiple reasons. Usually it's that they worry about sort of discipline and control, uh, classroom management, rather than actually the, the ESL instruction itself, which for a lot of new teachers is quite a concept to get their heads around. Um, they then have to worry about the whole classroom management side of things. Um, so yeah, I've, I've taught all ages from three years old up to, uh, you know, up to uh, adults. Um, you'll find again, depending on where you are in the world, 
No, in fact, it won't. You'll always teach a wide range. Everywhere in the world will have students at every level. Um, for Spain, for example, I would start my start my teaching at usually around sort of three o'clock because they finish school slightly early. As soon as they finish school, you've got the sort of three and the four-year-olds. Then you'd have the five and the six-year-olds, then the eight and the nine-year-olds, then the 12-year-olds, and then you'd have the C1s and the, you know, the B1s and then the B2s. And so you, you're you literally starting with kids. And then by the time, it's kind of like an evolution of, of, of language through the day. And then you, you finish off with your with your adults, which was actually quite nice in Spain, because quite often they would, ask, they would invite you to go for tapas or something after the class with them and, you know, to have a kind of a bit of a, a language exchange. So as long as the school are OK with it and you're not, you know, doing, you know, you're not making money out of that. <laughs> that experience um as long as you know you're, you're, you're friendly with the students um yeah one of the, the great things about having adults later on in the day or uh, which you usually will do they'll tend to be your later classes um is that yes quite often they'll, they'll invite you out for a, a bite to eat or something after the class as well and uh then you can practice your spanish which obviously you're not allowed to do while you're in the classroom or the same with chinese but if you're if you're in the far east um china japan korea thailand predominantly you're going to be teaching kids younger learners that's a much bigger market um when you're in russia uh europe south america then you get slightly more um sort of teen and adult numbers because of the necessary uh, english for work um in in those countries whereas it's slightly different in china um but again you 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 will teach all ages um and uh, you need to be prepared for all ages the courses that we cover, they do look at um, methodologies which will cover all of the all of the age groups. Um, you obviously tweak things um, around the levels that you're that you're working at. And again, if you wanted to specialise in exam prep or business English or specifically looking at some of the the more sort of nuanced areas of young learners, then again, there are we have you know uh, professional development courses for those areas as well. But your typical TEFL course uh, course will cover the uh, methodology for all of the ages, which again, to answer your question, make sure you will teach in pretty much every country and every job, you'll have a mix. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's good to be prepared for all of them. Um, okay, next question. Uh, what uh, support did you have available during your time uh, teaching at, I suppose, various schools? Yeah, um, I think I sort of covered that in EF quite well. In China, loads and loads of support. You have, um, typically in any school you work at, you'll have your group of English teachers. You'll typically have a probably a smaller group of local teachers who will also be bilingual, um, particularly in uh, Asian countries. You'll have the, the local teachers there as well. Um, if you have very young learners, usually sort of three or four year old classes, in near all cases, you will have a TA, you have a teaching assistant with you in the class. Your TA is not there for you to necessarily translate or even really to classroom manage, but just to um, help with any any issues which are kind of above your control when dealing with very, very, very young learners. There might be toilet trips that need to be taken or certain accidents that happen. Um, and even if it is just some basic groundwork rules and expectations to the students, that's OK for your TA to translate for the very, very uh, younger students and much, much lower levels. So you'll usually have that support. Um, then you'll usually have a really good centre manager or a director of studies. Um, quite often the, the owner of the school, if it's a private enterprise you're working with, will be there supporting you. So I haven't really had any jobs where I've not been supported. Um, Certainly, the more experience you gain, the less support you'll be expected to need. If that you know, so you, you'll be you'll be left to your own devices. The more experience um, that you are, and obviously the, the the position that you take, sort of two or three years into your career as a TEFL teacher, will probably be very very different to your first job, where they're going to be giving you all of the training, all of the support, the development that you need. Um, I'm not saying that they won't continue to support and develop you, but they will leave you to a lot of your own more uh, sort of your your. Your, your autonomous teaching um the more the more experienced you get but yeah i've never been in a school where i've felt i'm unsupported and, and and no one's there to to help me um i think that you know m most most schools are, are pretty well set up to uh, to support their teachers yeah yeah it's good to hear um <laughs> okay great um and uh what did you do when you weren't teaching obviously again that depends where you are but um kind of <laughs> you said you had lots of holiday what what opportunities did you get outside of work 
Um, I mean, yeah, again, always with every single question and, and just the same as the questions I get on a day-to-day -day basis, not just from here, it all depends. Um, so again, as Rachel said, if you ever do inquire about TEFL, try and make it specific to where you are, what school, for example, because, um, yeah, with, um, you know, for, for example, Costa Rica, I mean, I, I would just be looking at flocks of toucans outside my window in the morning, just not even moving, or, or I would be surfing pretty much every day. Uh, I learned to surf in Costa Rica. Um, obviously, a country like that, you've got so much around you to do anyway. Um, a lot of dancing, <laughs> an awful lot of dancing. Um, but then in China, um, that's a different thing. You've got, you have a lot of um, public holidays there as well, huge number of public holidays. And it's a great place to, you know, being in Asia, you could, I would take the bus down to uh, Hanoi, stay the night in Vietnam, and then take another bus over to Laos. And you could be in Laos within two days by bus. So I would go and see Laos, see Cambodia, um, and do the whole backpacking thing just on a bus for 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 a couple of weeks um otherwise you know there's not many there's, in fact there's no places that i've taught where there's not been a really good group of uh foreign teachers around you as well and you know as as you as you are it's kind of you 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 become really really good friends you do a lot of things together you you organize a lot of trips a lot of sightseeing you know i mean in china there's countless places that you know the, the tourist bits that we that we went and did um otherwise just kind of just 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 relaxing and 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 enjoying the, the place where you live i mean uh, there are many reasons to get into tefl but probably the most obvious and apparent is to just to see the world is, is to go and actually experience these places so you know in your free time just experiencing the culture learning learning the language um a lot of a lot of good schools will also offer language programs as well um they'll you you'll usually see it in the job spec and it'll be as part of a you know really you know key usp of this job is that they will offer you language uh, classes once or twice a week they help, but you probably won't even attend them, to be honest. You'll be getting so much language from around you, from the, the people that you're around, your local friends. Um, you know, again, if you're if you're living in a foreign country and you're you're polite and you're respectful and you get on with the local people, they will be uh, inviting you to do lots and lots of things. Um, so you'll have loads of invites of people wanting to share their culture and their, their country with you as well. As I said, as long as you do come across it in the right way and I've met TEFL teachers that don't, you know, people who move to China and expect the Chinese to change for a Western way. <laughs> Just, if that's the way of thinking, don't probably get into TEFL. Um, you're not going to change the world through TEFL, but what you might do is experience the benefits of all these other places and um, meet some amazing people along the way. Um, so, yeah, as long as you're kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're interested to go to the country uh, that you're staying in, that'll be one of the first questions you get on an interview is, um, why do you want to come to Spain, Venezuela, um, you know, uh, Vietnam? So if you are literally just seeking a job and you've applied for it online, um, do have some um, sort of a, prepar a, a, a an answer prepared as to why you actually want to go to that country or that city as well. Um, you know, half of the worry for a school taking on a new teacher is how well they're going to settle in, in this place and why are they here? Are they here for the right reasons? So, yeah, you know, going back to what I do in my free time, ideally, you're living in a place that you want to spend some time in. So you're seeing as much of it as you can. And um, yeah, just taking it all in. Yeah, great. And that's one of the things that we get asked a lot is uh, people worried that they won't, won't meet people over there or they won't make friends. And <laughs> you it, won't it, like, when you come back home because you'll miss being an audience exactly. talk about being away. Um, yeah, you you really will. You will. You'll, 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 you'll click instantly with your teaching cohort because you have so many things in common um, and you kind of will support each other because there's times when you're going to miss home. You will do, um, of course. Um, my rule was always three months. If you don't like somewhere, stick it out for three months, at least three months. Three months is long enough to really give you a, a proper view of somewhere, I think. Um, my first day in China, I nearly walked back on the plane. I, I, and I'd been in a lot of places. I just thought this was too much for me. I didn't, the, the change was, it was too intense. And I couldn't get my head around quite a bit of it. The food at first as well. Uh, I stayed for nearly 10 years. So yeah, get, get get to that three month period. And if you really, really, really can't bear it, then maybe consider your options then. But don't um, don't follow that initial gut reaction of, oh, what have I done? What am I doing here? Um, it will come good, it, it, it does. Um, 
And again, most of your contracts, even if you're far away, they will probably have a break clause in the contract as well, usually about six months. But there, there's usually a break clause to allow both parties to kind of consider their options if it doesn't work out. So you yeah. do have that. You know. No, that's a great tip. And it's also it's good to mention as well that being overwhelmed at the start is a part of it. And that's fine. It just you just need time to adapt. Um, so give yourself that time. Good tip, Rich. Okay. Um, we'll just do a few more questions, I think, and then we'll get to yours. Um, uh, oh, actually, we've already been through this um, about meeting other people overseas. So I'll skip that one. Mm -hmm. um, what do you enjoy most about tutoring uh, on virtual classroom courses? Uh, easy. Uh, the cohort is so diverse now. It's brilliant. It's so cool. When we're doing it face to face, not that there's anything wrong with everybody in Aberdeen or everybody in Inverness, for example. They are lovely and we do have a bit of variation. But when we um, run the, the online classes now, we get people from literally all over the world. Of course, they're all native or fluent English speakers, so the, the English level is always superb. But we get people. I had uh, a student from Mongolia on my class this weekend just gone. Yeah. And I, I've got my own little tick list of students where I've had from all over the world. And Mongolia was a new one for me. I mean, perfect English, fantastic trainee teacher but yeah based in Mongolia it was so cool um people coming in for all different backgrounds all different skill sets some of the people on our courses are experienced teachers some of them are brand new teachers and with the zoom class I think because everyone feels that kind of awkward every no, no one loves zoom let's be honest no one really loves zoom we've gotten used to zoom but who loves it I mean it's it's weird um and when everyone has that kind of zoom awkwardness together it helps to build a bond i feel and I, I personally i feel that my 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 groups click better and more on zoom than we did in a physical classroom which sounds completely crazy um but it really is what i found and yeah this is someone who as i said i'm a complete luddite with technology i really don't like apps and smartphones and i can't stand i mean i'm having to hide my face on the camera at the moment because I, I can't stand being on camera um, but I love the Zoom sessions, and I promise you that's not a plug for these courses. <laughs> I genuinely, uh, genuinely enjoy the Zoom sessions. People feel that they need to have that bricks and mortar experience to feel that they've got something out of their teaching course. I, I, I agree with the most part of that, that it is good to get that practice consolidation. Uh, it doesn't need to be bricks and mortar, though, is the bottom line. Um, what I would be doing in the physical classroom and what I now do on the Zoom classroom is about 90% the same. It's just tweaking, um, you know, once once those of you maybe who are tuned in who already are experienced ESL teachers, you'll know that your methodologies you can apply to different levels, different um, different paradigms, just with a slight tweak. So, yeah, working online is fun, uh, and it also gives us the opportunity to demonstrate physical classroom techniques in an online space, which then obviously allows people to get a a backdoor glimpse of online teaching as well through the through through the sessions. So yeah, I, I love them. I think that just but yeah, the original point, it's the it's the it's the cohort now. We get such a wide and varied cohort um in the sessions that it's it's just really, really good fun. Yeah, and also you kind of get to, you know, almost travel the world through your students <laughs> now. Exactly. now yeah, you can learn so much okay, about the cultures. Yeah. Uh, indeed. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, okay, going back to um, kind of what, uh, what questions do you get asked most as a um, TEFL advisor? Um, oh. I probably know what you're going to say. <laughs> No, I mean, I think I probably covered a couple of them in there. I, I, do you know, actually, I think the one of the most, not frustrating, there's no frustrating questions, of course, we're super patient and tolerant of all questions, but there's, there's one question which I think, I, I never asked it myself, but I seem to get asked it countless times, even a day, and that's, how do I find my first TEFL job? I think people think it's a lot more difficult yeah. than it actually is. Okay. And again, again, not to be facetious, but the internet is a really, really, really useful tool when you're looking for, for jobs. I mean, it sounds silly, but even considering the different acronyms that are used within this industry, when you're trying to find a job, EFL, so Echo Foxtrot Lima, ESL, Echo Sierra Lima, for example. So EFL jobs, ESL jobs, TESOL jobs, TEFL jobs, 
even changing around the acronyms will increase the res you know the different results that you get in your search in your search um you know i've i've only ever used um pages like esl base or esl cafe and i've found jobs all over the world using those before um you've also got of course our own job center here which is a comp uh, you know a comprehensive uh, and up to date job board which you will have uh, exclusive access to for life if you uh, take a course with the TEFL org. Um, but yeah, genuinely, guys, it's not as difficult as people seem to think it is. Um, online jobs, the same, you know, uh, you can join a company, you can freelance, you can create your own platform, which, you know, creating your own platform and marketing yourself, although potentially quite lucrative, might be quite difficult to kind of gain traction and pick up students in the early days. So you might want to consider just joining a company who can you can cut your teeth there before you feel confident and start maybe building your network around you to uh, market yourself online. But yeah, I think the, the most common question is how do I go around finding my first job? Um, so yeah, literally use, use the job boards. Um, and it's, you know, but you, you, you need to be specific in, in, in where you want to go. Do you want to go to South America? Do you want to go to Asia? Do you want to, you know, work in Europe? Where are you looking for? Narrow it down, have a, you know, do a bit of research on the country um, then you'll find that, you know, if you probably, you know, in, even in a search, in a search uh, together, you know, combine TEFL and that country and jobs, I'm sure you'll find at least one or two um, pages where they are um, posting listings. Be careful, though, that you don't just fall into a job advert, which is only there to get you a buy, to, to buy a course through a certain company, um, which is why I sort of talk about places like ESL Base and ESL Cafe, because they are just really, really good job boards um, and independent in, in that respect. Um, if you're looking at South America, I would suggest going over there first and trying to find a job. Yeah, if you can find one online, all good and well, but because they don't have the, the tight visa requirements that they do in Asia, for example, you'll find that they're much more happy to hire people who turn up in smartly dressed with a CV in hand or a resume in hand. Um, and ego. even for that, we have our guide to Latin America, for example, where country by country, we've listed the different types of institutions and, and areas where you could work and some, some sort of base one advice of where you can start looking. If it's uh, Asia, then you'll typically find the jobs will be advertised online. Um, and again, I've, I've listed two of those websites where they'll usually there's countless jobs. Um, at the moment, you need to be realistic in that we are still what two years now into a worldwide pandemic, the likes of which we've never, never been prepared for. We don't know what's really happening long term. Um, obviously, in, in the meantime, there is there are windows of movement and there's certain logistics which are easier than others. Um, but one of the, the hardest things you'll find at the moment with finding a job is actually getting into the country, getting through the quarantine, having the right documentation, which is something that you know, although we're trying to stay abreast of, it's obviously not our, our, our key area of expertise. Um, you know, in, in, in a typical pre or hopefully post pandemic world, um, getting a job is much, much easier than you actually think. Um, and as I said, as long as you keep an eye on the job boards, keep abreast of our blog um, and, our, and, our, and our webinars, because we update things weekly, um, including, you know, how to find your first online job. Um, have a look on our blog there and we, we, we make a lot of this information available. But yeah, that's probably the question I get asked the most, um, which actually has the, the easiest answer to. Yeah, there's yeah. loads of jobs online, <laughs> much easier than you think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's funny because actually a lot of the questions we've got in the comments are how to find a job. So that's uh, yeah. very helpful. You've, you've answered about yeah, half the comments already. <laughs> It's tough at the moment, okay? So I'm just going to be yeah. realistic. Maybe I've said, you know, look online and you've said, yeah, there's nothing. And what, you, what you'll also find at the moment now is a lot more jobs are looking for a degree when you don't necessarily need a degree. Um, they want teaching experience, whereas they wouldn't usually be looking for teaching experience. And that's an, an obvious effect of the supply demand side of the market you know we've, we've had the, the the amount of positions which are available uh, currently have shrunk because of the pandemic again um there are obviously you know the, the the online market has been growing exponentially for a long time and will continue to do so however the supply of new teachers when you've you know had entire industries collapse or be paused or whatever else you know that there's we, we make no secret of the fact that there is not quite a glut, but certainly there is a, 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 there is a good number of teachers at the moment, and therefore a lot of the jobs which would usually be, 
new, you know, no, ex- they wouldn't even ask for experience or a degree. They'd just be looking for someone who's got their TEFL, got their TESOL. Um, you know, they would obviously, obviously say experience preferred, but, you know, you, you'd still be able to apply because of the lower number of jobs and the higher number of candidates at the moment. You're seeing a lot of uh, kind of pre-screening done at the uh, job spec stage. So asking for X, Y, Z criteria that they wouldn't usually ask for. My advice would be to still apply anyway. I would still be applying for jobs and then, you know, seeing seeing if you can talk to them. Um, you know, uh, I'm not saying lie on your CV if it specifically asks you that you, if you have, if you have advice. But if, you know, I would, when I was applying for TEFL jobs at times when I wasn't being approached, I would be just, if anything that said TEFL, as long as, you know, if, you know, you needed a degree, you needed a TEFL, great. Anything else, I, I would just apply. I would just apply anyway. And if they get back in touch with you, have a chat. You, you might you might be able to impress them at interview stage and then negate that need for experience. Not in all cases, but yeah, without repeating myself, it's usually fairly easy to find a job. Any industry in the world at the moment is suffering with what's going on and Teffel's not immune to that either. Um, so it is a little bit more, it's a lot more competitive than it would be at the moment, but I don't see this um, paradigm lasting as forever. Otherwise, well, we're in the pandemic forever. So hopefully we're going to get through this one way or the other. And then when you do see the the international landscape reopen fully, that will obviously then offset. And, you know, a lot of teachers, we, we've got a lot of teachers who are teaching online at the moment, but they're desperate to teach abroad. They're just waiting for the OK to get going again. So and then when they do that, that will obviously then free up more um, more, more online work as well. So hopefully it's just a, a game of stuck in the mud that we're playing at the moment. Yes, exactly. And uh, like you say, once, well, fingers crossed, once this uh, pandemic blows over to some degree, um, we do expect the um, kind of demand for teachers abroad to increase as well. So mm-hmm. the job will increase with that, hopefully, as well. Um, okay, so we have, we'll get to some of uh, your questions in the comments now. Like I said, um, Rich has kind of answered quite a few of those kind of by accident. So I'll try and leave those out. Um, we've got one um, from Robert Sherwin that might be interesting uh, to answer, who says, um, what's the average duration of a TEFL um, assignment slash job? And are there any short term assignments from one to three months? That's actually a question we get quite a lot as well. Uh, I think you said it was Robert there, was it? So thanks. Thanks, yeah. Robert, for that. Um, again, <laughs> it's the same old thing. It depends. When a working visa is involved, typically it's going to be 12 months. And that's going to be, you know, they're not going to, the school are not going to sponsor you, which they'll need to do for the working visa if it's for a very, very short or an ad hoc commitment, because the visa requirement will either take X amount of weeks, months to arrange. Uh, it will certainly cost them a lot of money up front as well to, to process it. So then that they're going to want the teacher for a minimum of 12 months on the contract. Sometimes it will be the visas only issued if it is a 12 month contract. Um, but as I sort of mentioned earlier on, Robert, the quite often and in most cases, there will be the option of a six month break in that 12 month contract, because as I said, it doesn't always work out from both parties, uh, particularly when we're talking about, you know, adjusting to a, to a foreign country. The school is realistic. It doesn't work out for everybody. Um, shorter term contracts, yes, you'll get them. Um, again, typically less so in countries where you require a visa. It's, it's, it's a simple rule of thumb. If you don't need the visa so much, then you can pick up ad, ad hoc work, shorter term contracts. Certainly in Europe, um, it was typical for people to work for three or four different schools at once and just take their hours here and there and kind of, you know, create create their their weekly schedule with a, a range of different schools and private students. Um, so, yeah, typically you can get shorter term contracts the closer you are to home, say, for example, coming from the UK, um, the same as if you're based in the US, I'm sure there's a lot more sort of ad hoc and short term work there. Um, the UK and Europe pre-pandemic was very, very good for summer schools. Um, you'd have, you know, summer camps, summer schools, um, what they call these immersion excursions where the students are coming over and then you're guiding them through Europe or through the US or through, you know, the United Kingdom. So those were really, really good jobs for new teachers to pick up because they were short, they were more ad hoc, um, and they were a great opportunity for teachers to kind of, you know, cut their bones to, to, to get some experience under their belt as well. That's one of the big problems that we've had in terms of people actually getting experience since the pandemic 
is that was a really, really, really good atmosphere, good environment for the student, for, for new teachers to, as I said, get a bit of traction, get some experience, get some short term work, even hop around and see some different types of students in different countries. Um, pandemic. <laughs> so once that hopefully again eases or we learn to live around it or with it, whatever it is, then we start getting a lot of these kind of summer summer schools and summer camps opening up. Um, then you'll find that the positions are a lot shorter uh, and a lot more flexible. So yeah, Robert, good question. The the further afield you are, particularly if a working visa is required, the more likelihood it's going to be that it's going to be a 12 month contract, but it should have a six month break. Cool. That's a good answer. Thank you, Robert, for that question. That is a good one. Um, we've got another good question from Mark Benjamin here, who um, it's a question we get quite a lot as well. Um, why go for a TEFL course over a Salesforce course? Cheaper. <laughs> that's a good answer <laughs> um i mean selta's good and we're not here and we never do get into any mudslinging at all um particularly with something like the selta which was yeah, not exactly but it, it look at the selta as kind of the blueprint or the, one of the first the pioneer for these esl training courses um in one way shape or form most TEFL courses now flatter the CELTA in, 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 in one aspect, perhaps. Um, the thing with the CELTA, though, is the reason why ourselves and some of the other um, larger online course providers exist is because Te CELTA doesn't offer the, the flexibility that an online TEFL course does. I'm not quite sure what they're doing now and how they've adjusted or pivoted during the pandemic, but typically it's like four or eight, eight weeks in a classroom. It's quite rigid. Um, the only, as I said, the, the level of training received on CELTA is good. You will you will receive practicum um, with real students, but I, as I said, I'm not really here to promote the CELTA course, funnily enough. Um, but it is a good course. It's in depth. It's it's well received. It's well recognised. Um, it, what it doesn't do though is it won't cover young learners. If you wanted to take the the young learner equivalent, I think it's about another nine hundred. I don't want to start quoting numbers, but it's another big cost on top to get the. The, the, the chart the, the, the younger learners equivalent um, if you're looking specifically to work in maybe the Middle East uh, and even again only specific countries or maybe you're looking to build a really firm career as an ESL teacher in the UK those would probably be the only two times I might have the discussion about whether a CELTA would be worth the investment and it's a lot more expensive than a condition uh, a conventional TEFL course um, I've when I when I've hired teachers and that will be you know dozens of hundreds around the world. If I had a CV that came across my desk and one had a CELTA and one had a TEFL, they'd both still get the interview. To be honest with you, um, so you know it doesn't really. Oh, there's a CELTA. I'm going to interview this person over the TEFL. Not in my experience. And sometimes people who have done a CELTA and spent the extra you know spent a lot of money taking what they view as a prestigious course they can sometimes bring that across with a bit of a chip you know i've had a cell to therefore i'm better than a tefl teacher and believe it or not tefl teachers don't always like that and the person who's employing you might be a tefl teacher themselves as well so yeah as i said i'm not slinging slinging mud at the cell to, but in my experience i haven't ever come across a teacher who is better off from doing a cell to. good answer um Okay, brilliant. I hope that answered your question, Mark. Um, okay, we actually have a question from, um, I apologize if I uh, pronounce your name incorrectly, Geo Vale, um, who says that um, you were his tutor um, a couple of weeks ago. So he's saying, hello. Oh, yes. Hello. Um, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Um, so he's got a couple of questions. Um, you've answered a little bit of them already, but um, he says, if you go back in time um, and look at your first few years as a TEFL teacher, what would you do differently? I, I love that. I'm just like, reading through, yeah, the imposter yeah. syndrome. Um, yeah, I suffer from that every day I wake up, actually, imposter <laughs> syndrome. I need to remember who I am and remind myself that is who I am. Um, no, I mean, good questions there. If you could go back in time, what would you do differently? <sighs> wow, do you know what? Uh, this is going to sound super arrogant, but nothing really, because I, in the beginning, I was kind of, I, I loved it. I was excited. I wasn't, if, if, you're, if you're a super, super, super nervous person, I'm not saying TEFL's not for you, but you're going to find it more difficult than someone who isn't afraid to make mistakes, doesn't mind laughing at themselves. And that was me in school. I'm, I'm not afraid to laugh at myself or to make a mistake. Um, I, you know, kind of, 
use the embarrassment as a form of making everybody else feel relaxed. And I don't know if if that actually works or if it's just in my head how it how it ends up. But that's kind of the attitude I, I took into my first class. I wasn't nervous of my first class. I I planned it for about two weeks when I, you know, only needed to plan it for about two minutes, to be honest, that class. It was such a basic class, but I was so worried with the planning and the preparation um, that, uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't I was actually worried about interacting with the students and going in. It was a case of how my materials worked. So, um, no, I don't, I don't think I would have really done anything differently at the time then. Um, I think maybe looking back and some things I, I, I might have done differently um, I think probably I, I would have, I, if, if, if possible, I would have liked to have spent a little bit more time in one school if I could to, um, do you know, do you know, it's, it's actually a very, very difficult, difficult, difficult question to answer because honestly, if, if you ask me now about my life and what I do differently, I can talk to you until tomorrow about things I would do differently in my life in terms of TEFL. I've, I've had a really, really good experience with TEFL. Um, I felt I made the right choice at the right time. Um, I went to Costa Rica when I needed to get away from the grey UK. Uh, I enjoyed Costa Rica, but I found that that it was quite difficult for me to get work because they were taking American teachers over British teachers there. Um, so I then was approached by EF to come to China and you know, I, I'd never heard of the city and I just jumped into it. I jumped there and I, and I went and, and, and the shoe fit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, it's, 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 I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to evade your question, but I actually wouldn't have done anything differently in the way that I, I, I went around Tefling. I was going to say maybe I wish I'd stayed a bit more time in more schools, but I, I, don't, I didn't have that much time in my life to have spent the amount of time I would have in all of the schools. I was, you know, nearly, nearly, nearly six years in one school, two years in another, three in another, for example. So, um, you know, I, I don't really have regrets. Um, just having a look at this imposter syndrome. Yes, I did have imposter syndrome when I was working at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and everybody else I was working with had PhDs. Um, and they actually had the patches on their elbows and the pipe. They were, they were your, your proper old professors. And because I didn't have a PhD, there was they weren't actually very happy about me even having a position in the university. Um, but I'd come from a, a TEFL background, and what they were looking to do was inject more of a TEFL methodology into their EAP classes. And uh, so, yeah, I would I would feel like a bit of an imposter that I'm, I'm not really good enough to be here until the first the end of the first semester when the students were looking to select their next teacher. And I had a waiting list for my class and the old professors had no students signed up yet. So again, TEFL teachers do make fun teachers because we're engaging. It's a communicative approach. Um, and we're always thinking of, you know, what the students doing, what the students producing rather than, um, you know, being a stuffy, boring, rote university type lecturer. So yeah, there, there were moments when I kind of suffered from imposter syndrome, I think at that stage, but then you do a good job and, um, you know, you, you can, you know, you, you 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 know when you're doing a good job. You, you you know if you've done a good job. You know when you finish the class if you've done everything that you can for the students, or if you've really just tried to get through that class. And unfortunately, I've known a lot of teachers who are just trying to get through classes. And if that's your, you know, if if that's the way that you're viewing it, there's no there's a lot of easier jobs that you can just get through the day than, than being an ESL teacher. So yeah, you've got to love it. You've got to be a bit mad to do it because you've got to be you know ready to jump into any kind of a a situation around the world any kind of job um different students that you you have to be very resilient um and yeah and full of self-confidence and so for someone who does have self self-confidence it's quite difficult to look back and say things that i would have changed because that's not how i live my life well that's, so, that's yeah, a difficult question very, <laughs> a no one. it's a good answer though as well and it's interesting as well that your imposter syndrome came more from other people's reaction to you rather than yourself so that's mm -hmm. maybe something to take away from it as well um okay we've just got maybe time for a couple more questions um the next one i think we've got coming up sorry a lot of you have asked questions but a lot of them rich has already covered so i'm going to leave those out um <laughs> Hope Anderson says, how can a tutor monitor their effectiveness? So I suppose, how do you know you're doing a good job? 
Yes, hi Hope, and I'm assuming that's Hope from my class over the weekend as well. Everyone's logging back in to see me. Yeah, Hope. Um, I've actually got an email construction uh, in construction to get back to you on that point, Hope. Okay, but while we're asking it right now, um, how can you monitor their effectiveness? What do you mean, the students' effectiveness or the effectiveness of your materials themselves? As how to teach students? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing what you mean there is kind of how you can monitor your effectiveness as a, as, as a teacher. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's much easier when you work in a, in a teaching team because what I would always suggest to do for my staff, and you would, if your, you know, if your manager or your do, your director doesn't suggest it themselves is to peer observe, lots of peer observations. It's really, really, those of you who are in here and are teachers, you'll, you'll attest to this, that it's much easier to teach 10 strangers as it is to teach one person that you know. It's, you know, when, when it's another teacher watching you, it's much, much more difficult. Um, but if you can get over that and you can observe each other and you can critique each other, that's really, really helpful to kind of monitor how effective you're actually being. Uh, if you don't have that opportunity, then as long as you've got your students' position uh, permission, record your class, record your online class, um, set up a recording. We often used to have, most schools actually would have a video camera, but nowadays you can do it on your camera phone anyway, but set up again with permission to record yourself. Look at what you do well, look at what you don't do well, see your students' reactions to yourself. Um, and that's one way that you can sort of monitor how effective you are. Um, the other way is obviously through, you know, through testing your students. So as we've spoken about on, on the classes before, always using concept questions, always checking for understanding. Don't move on to any part of your class unless you have made sure individually, if needs be, that you know that the students can explicitly explain to you what they've just done or what they're about to do, rather than you know giving okay everyone, everybody understand these kind of you know pitfalls. Um, you can monitor your effectiveness in what the students are able to. Uh, demonstrate in terms of yeah their, their understanding and you do that lots and lots of uh, moments throughout your, your lesson when as I said you're asking which is something we cover on the course but how to you know look at concept questions checking for understanding um, then you can also set quizzes set your, set, set your students quizzes see how well they do on the quiz um, if it's the same students who are passing the quiz the same students who are failing the quiz then it's probably not you as a teacher but you need to look at the students and look at their learning needs what their learning style is maybe then consider using different multiple intelligences in your class to cater to that student so yeah good 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 question i hope but quite difficult to answer concisely because you know there's there's, there's quite a few things that you can do there but yeah good question yeah no that's a good kind of um you know, round up at least. Um, okay, I think we've probably just got time for one more question. So um, I'll grab this one from Kirsty Suttle. Hello, Kirsty. Um, she says, how do you set up your online classroom? So I guess this is about, um, yeah, like she mentions, um, okay. using a whiteboard yeah. or how to, how to actually deliver an online class, I suppose. It depends. Again, same old answer. <laughs> same old answer. It depends. I mean, um, if you're... If you're if you're your own your own tutor and you've got a student and you're arranging it on Zoom, I think some people still use Skype, but most people use Zoom these days. Um, obviously, you've got Google Meetings, Hangouts, all of these things you can use as well. Um, I would usually just use Zoom because Zoom has the share screen, it has the whiteboard function on Zoom. Um, you can obviously embed all of your your audio and your media through Zoom as well. Um, We've had students on my virtual classes where they have had the whiteboard behind them and then they're using sock puppets and they're writing on the board and uh, nothing wrong with that at all. That's fine. Don't forget to bring really uh, into your online classes. So do use actual objects around you and bring them in and try and incorporate them, get the students out of their chairs, going to find things, races to find things around the house. You, you can make, you know, you can still use a lot of TPR or total physical response in your online classes, but to go back to your your original question, Kirsty, um, if you use any of the the standard um, online meeting tools, then you'll find that they've got things like whiteboard and annotate feature already built in. They've got things like the chat boxes where the students commun can communicate. Zoom has got breakout rooms when you can put the students into separate pairs or groups. Uh, otherwise, if you're working for one of the larger online companies, they'll probably have their own platform and system which they will use and everything will be built into that, including usually the lesson plans, the assessments, the extra materials, even the slides for the PowerPoint. 
Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll usually have that, and again, they'll have the the, the whiteboard feature interactive with their with their um, with their uh, their platform. Um, if you haven't taught, if you're looking to teach online and you're not the most computer literate, just get familiar with PowerPoint. Or if you're using iOS, Keynote, whatever it is, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't know much about iOS, but yeah, get familiar with PowerPoint because that's the best way to run an online class. Uh, and if you do, don't put information on your PowerPoint, just use imagery. That's probably my only advice for that. That's good advice. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think, um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. We do have a lot more questions. So we'll try and get to uh, to answer your questions after the webinar as well. Um, thank you all for tuning in. And um, thank you, Rich, for um, you. answering all of those questions. I hope you all found that really helpful. Um, and yes, tune in. Uh, we usually run these webinars every week, um, but we'll announce them kind of at the start of each week. So uh, do tune in again next time for our other webinar. Um, and enjoy the rest of your week. Okay, thank you all. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Bye.